So our New Testament lesson is a gospel from, um, lesson in John. This is chapter 12, and we find our reading in the first 11 verses. And no surprise, this is about Mary of Bethany anointing Jesus. Listen for God's word. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for Jesus. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those at table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? Judas said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She has bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Oh God, this word before us this morning asks us to lean in a little bit closer to understand the gathering of your people and the, the power of your coming among us. Help us to lean in so that we might understand. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I did want to talk about this story in John 12 because it's something of a complicated story, even though it's so easy to tell and so very, very visual. But there's an awkward tension about all of it and in all of it. The characters are seemingly doing their own thing. They're just off doing things. Martha is baking. Lazarus is sitting upright and taking in nourishment. The Judas is judging, Mary is anointing, the crowds are gawking, the temple leaders are conspiring, and death is looming. There are lots of pockets of things going on. And Jesus, Jesus is the guest of honor over all of this chaos. And perhaps that is the fitting picture the Bible begins not with the beauty of creation holding itself together, but with the spirit of God that is hovering over the face of dark, chaotic waters. It is always good to look back and to, to back up when you're reading a scripture to consider where it sits in the middle of other scriptures, where it sits in the Bible. For this passage, it follows a very memorable story of Jesus having raised his friend Lazarus from the dead, from dead, the dead, from death. Lazarus has been good and dead for three days before Jesus showed up. So the miracle of what Jesus did was overwhelming and compelling. And many people, writes John, began to believe that Jesus might be somebody worth believing. At the end of the chapter 11, the powers that be are conspiring to kill Jesus because they can't 
afford to lose the allegiance of the people. There's no room for another leader in Rome or in the church. And knowing this, knowing that the conspiring has started, Jesus withdraws from public view and goes to their friend's home in Bethany, the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. As I began to think about this passage, I began to think about what does a family do in the face of such a generous, extravagant act when one of your own has been raised from the dead? What do you do when someone gives you your life back? Some of you have experienced just that. What can you do? The depth of gratitude is overwhelming. It's, it's hard to even come up with an appropriate response. According to this story, you invite him to dinner. We might chuckle at the absurdity of that. Just last week, Dan had invited us to think about another dinner, another feast, and where that stood in relation to Lent and to the parables. It was the parable of the father with two sons. Dan invited us to consider which side we were on. Would we be on the, son, the younger son's side or the older son's side? Would we have been on the side of the younger son who had gone and squandered all that he had in the world and now came dragging back to be satisfied with whatever pittance his father was willing to give him? Or are we the older son, begrudging the son's return, begrudging his father's beyond appropriate welcome of his younger son? At the center of all this is the generosity of the father and the extravagance of welcome. So we read about extravagance again today and the resentment of it as well. It's hard to know where to train your eye in this story because there is so much going on until Mary breaks open that bottle of expensive perfume. All of the gospel writers are telling this story in one way or another and this is the only one that implies that it's Mary of Bethany, that it is the sister of Lazarus. In this story, we are asked to get a picture of a deeply tender moment. Hands to feet, hair to skin, soaked fingers to soaked toes. Had we been there, we might have averted our eyes. It was that deeply tender. But Debbie Thomas writes, this is one of the most provocative stories in the New Testament. And somehow we can't help but look. Mary breaks open this bottle of expensive perfume and there's nothing that leads us to think in this story that Mary is trying to get everyone's attention. She's not trying to do something so that everyone would look at her. But no one can turn away now because it's like the perfume comes in and drags them towards what is happening. The meal that Martha is preparing, which we usually think when there's a dinner and the smell calls people to the table, instead it is this perfume, this, this thing between Mary and Jesus. The conversation around the table quiets, and John says the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The spotlight is on Mary at Jesus' feet. And then Judas interrupts, and he says, What a waste! deeply tender moment. What a waste. 
We must not miss the parallel. Whose side is Judas sitting on, the younger brother or the older one? We might have been sympathetic with Judas at that moment because he was right after all. It was a lot of money. It was a year's salary worth of perfume. Somebody had to work a whole year to afford what that took in one pour. If someone came to our treasures in the church and asked for a year's worth of resources to pour out in a single moment, we would be hard pressed to convince that it was a good idea. And Judas makes a good point that there are plenty of places where this could have been better spent. His suggestion of the poor was not a suggestion out of thin air. It was expected that a good Jew would carry out devotion for the poor as part of their devotion to God. When we visited Israel three years ago, we, our guide told us um, that the, it was good, he was helping us to understand the religious culture at the time and um, culture that continued into present day. And he pointed out that in Deuteronomy 15, verse 11, there was a commandment, a duty, that God's people were to care for others, and especially the poor, as part of their devotion to God. It's called practicing mitzvah. To be a blessing to others is also to receive a blessing, it is said. I saw an example of this in the Yehuda um, open air market where the vendors sold a variety of things from fruit and vegetable, pot and pans, jewelry. And I had stopped to consider a purchase when an older woman pushed past me in the very crowded market and she was begging from the vendor for something to eat. She was saying she just wanted something to eat. Her begging was so insistent and he finally gave her some bread. His compassion moved me and made my own purchase from him more sweet. I said to him, ah, you're practicing your mitzvah. He just glared at me and he handed me my package and I chalked it to a language barrier. Maybe I had used the wrong word. When I got back on the bus, I told my son what had happened. I was just so pleased with that interchange. And he said, Mom, he wasn't generous. As soon as you turned your back, he took the bread back and pushed her away. And in fact, when I looked at my own receipt, the vendor had grossly overcharged me for my own purchase. To this day, that purchase sits in my cabinet untouched because it reminds me not of mitzvah, but of just the opposite. The gospel writer makes an aside remark to us, the readers, when he says that Judas's argument for the poor might sound righteous, but his motives were not. While Jesus' response to him has created much discussion. It's created much discussion among scholars and among students when Jesus says to him, leave her alone. You're always going to have the poor with you, but you're not always going to have me. People have wrestled with that. What did Jesus mean? Aren't we to care for the poor? Aren't we to take care of the weak among us? What did Jesus mean? The poor you're going to have with you always. You will not have me. He did not argue the extravagance that Mary portrayed of pouring out this year's worth of perfume on his feet. He simply said, Mary has chosen well. But it was not at the expense of the poor. So we have, we're holding these tensions of Mary's extravagance and Judas's self-centered criticism and now we're seeing that 
Jesus stands in between, choosing Mary. Jesus does not fault her. In fact, he cherishes her act and he blesses it. Mary gets, in fact, what Judas does not. She knows who Jesus is. It is an emotional scene. And the extravagant act she expresses rises from an overflowing generosity that Jesus in his own life is about to pour out himself for the world. Mary's act of extravagance only rises out of Jesus' own. Her act is a response to who Jesus is and what Jesus is about to do. I am with you now, the poor you will always have, loving Jesus extravagantly because his extravagant love for us empowers us to be Jesus in the world. There's a woman named Elvina Hall who in 1865, she sang in the choir, and one Sunday, she was in the choir and in the middle of prayer, she was deeply moved by what she heard, even though later pressed, she was not sure what it was. But in the midst of it, she was moved to come to a realization that she had a poem in her heart. And she wrote the words because she had nothing else but the hymnal in front of her. So she opened up the front of the hymnal and in the front of the hymnal she wrote this. Jesus paid it all, all to the I O. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Many of you may know that. Well, after worship, she handed the the hymnal to the pastor, and unknown to her, earlier in the week, the choir, the organist, had come up with his own version of music. And he had given it to the pastor, and this new hymn that he wrote was, All to Christ I Owed, I Owe. And the pastor took that poem and took the music and they fit perfectly. Jesus paid it all, all to the I O. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. There's a story that's told about a, an important political figure who called the Reverend Billy Graham. It's, for whatever reason, it's one of my favorite stories. Reverend Graham had this ritual of beginning his day in a time of prayer, almost two hours of prayer he would begin each day. And when this person called, he was in the middle of prayer, and he instructed the person who answered the phone, tell, tell them I will call them back. I can't speak to them right now. And so when he did call them back, he got an earful about how incensed this person was to have been kept waiting. To which Graham responded, I was in prayer. If I had spoken to you then, I would have nothing for you now. Jesus was not saying that the care of the poor was not important. In fact, he admits when he says you're always going to have the poor with you. You, the church, you, the followers of me and my father, the poor will always be there for your care. But you will not always have me. What he is saying is that we are even more equipped to serve the poor and the world only when we offer our whole selves to God. When I think about this, I think about the times that I've given out of an empty heart or carelessly. I imagine the times that I have carelessly thrown a dollar into someone's cup just to assuage my own guilt, 
compared to leaving a time of prayer and communion and feeling so moved by the depth of the need of someone who is Christ's child. So on your way out from church, your action to offer a meal, to invite someone to lunch at your table, it shifts when you've been sitting with Christ, which serves the poor. Which one of those serves the poor as Jesus imagines? Our true generosity as Christians rises out of our time spent with the one who has been generous beyond our imagining. Jesus paid it all, all to the I.O. In only days, the festival of the Passover will begin, and Jesus will gather again at a table, and this time he will be host, and he will know that it is only a matter of time that his life will be poured out. This morning, we gather at table by Christ's invitation. And it is a time for us to linger, to be at the feet of Christ, to offer in our hearts and our thoughts and through our prayers whatever we have to give and to wait to see how Christ will use us in this world. This is our word for us today. The generosity of Christ evokes our own generosity, and not just generosity, but extravagance. And it's off-putting, and it's humbling. It is the work to which we have been called. Amen.